Thanks a lot. Before I go with you through my handout, I would like to make three confessions. The first one is, um, unlike the other speakers, I do not have a written paper in polished English, and the reason why I do not have it is that whenever I start reading my own papers, I stop believing in them. So it's better to speak free, even though it's going to be in clumsy English. The second confession is that um, I was a bit surprised about the invitation to this conference because I have no theological background, even worse, I cannot believe in God, um, no matter whether Christian or not, and I do not see this as a strength, but rather as a weakness. And um, why I then found it interesting to come here was that in my um, system of beliefs, um, it goes the other way around. So for me, one of the strongest evidences in favor of belief in God is that uh, quite many important religious leaders are pacifists. And this gives me, uh, this is sort of comes not close to a, to a proof of God exist God's existence, but at least it gives some, pulls me into that direction somewhat. The other pulling force is um, religious music, obviously. And the third um, confession is um, that I'm for years and years now trying to formulate a pacifist position, and I do not know how to call it. Um, I don't know if pra pragmatist pacifism is a good name for it, I do not know, I, I used to call it epistemological pacifism a while ago, but this was misunderstood. Um, and let me just try to explain what I mean by that. And I cannot offer strong arguments in favor of it, but my talk m is more concerned about um, unfolding this position and making clear what, uh, what I mean in it, and then inviting you to try it for a while in your life and uh, see what it does to you. And, this, um, and when I use the word pragmatist, I do not mean the notion of pragmatist um, in the sense that we just um, we get things done or something like that, but rather in the sense of the American pragmatist philosophical tradition, which is a very deep and strong um, movement still alive today. And for those uh, who know a little about philosophy, I could add that uh, I am here influenced quite strongly by Hilary Putnam's reading of the pragmatist American tradition, which of course is um, distorting um, the real texts, um, which I learned from you, thanks for, for that, that um, in fact, of course, he simplifies matters, and uh, I do not deal here with the exegesis of those great figures such as James and Peirce and so forth, but rather use what I've learned from Putnam about them. Okay, so let's get started. Um, uh, in the first two sections, I want to mislead you somewhat, and in a few of our discussions yesterday, I believe um, this misleading picture um, was on the table several times. Um, section one, two different forms of moral protest against war. On the one hand, the pacifist might base his protest on general principles, such as what one could call pacifist rigorism. Participation in any war is eo ipso morally wrong, end of story, right? That's one way to put it. But then it, it seems you could also say, um, that you start from facts about individual cases rather than from moral principles, and I call it case-by-case -case pacifism, uh, statement number one with a question mark. Um, given the facts about the individual case at issue, this or that specific war is morally wrong. And I find this is a more attractive approach at first sight because it forces you to look at the case. Rather than closing your eyes, you must look at what's going on in that moment in which um, the war is um, undertaken or contemplated. And um, thus, I think um, it's, it's better <coughs> to, to come up with a case-by-case -case story um, rather than starting with a rigorous principle where you can just say uh, no to war, and that's it. You don't have to, to, to argue any longer. And that's, uh, I would say, a bit too weak. Now, of course, you, you might say a case-by-case -case pacifism doesn't amount to pacifism proper. And thus, of course, you can generalize it into a general empirical claim. For example, pacifism of the century, I call this uh, statement uh, 100. Due to its actual characteristics, modern war is morally wrong, but it's theoretically conceivable that just wars or morally proper wars might occur even in modern times. 
So you could say it's, it's theoretically possible, my moral system allows for that possibility, but in our reality it never happens. And therefore, war is always wrong, or the war during the last century always was wrong. And of course, if you want to make an exception for the attack on Nazi Germany or the defense against Nazi Germany, you can have this exception and still you are pretty close to what one might call pacifism. Uh, I believe um, that the statements number one and 100 um, get only um, true substance if they are conjoined with some moral criterion as to when and how you judge um, the moral, moral rightness of war. And um, now you can come up with the many different ethical theories which you might plug in here. And I believe this, that the story that I'm going to tell you is independent of that choice. So uh, no matter whether you are utilitarian or a just war theorist according to the tradition of bellum justum or what have you, you can always come up with my result. So um, this is, um, I think, a little surprising that the pacifist worldview does not depend essentially on the moral theory with which you start. And this I want to convince you of today. Um, in order to, to um, make clear what um, sort of on first sight um, counterintuitive claim that is, um, I want to now in the second section give you a mis uh, want to continue with the misleading picture. It has to do with a misunderstanding of meta-ethics and broad circles of the population in politics and school and so forth, we believe in the gap between value and fact. This is, so, at least in German high schools, everybody is taught that you must distinguish between value and fact sharply. It's even called Hume's Law. Um, and um, I think this is wrong, and the pragmatist tradition in which I am uh, working here denies this explicitly and speaks in favor of an in, um, entanglement of fact and value. Now, to, uh, to flesh out a little on, on that, um, let us for the moment suppose we are utilitarians, act utilitarians, for example. Um, then one might think that you could um, factorize utilitarian passivism into an evaluative and a factual component. The evaluative component is the statement you on the handout. An individual was morally, morally wrong if and only if it's likely to produce greater harm than its peaceable alternatives. That's your, that's your moral theory. That's the values that you have. And um, the term harm here um, and its opposite, happiness, are supposed to be descriptive terms, right? It's, you can investigate psychologically how, how the amount, how big the amount of harm and happiness are in some given course of events. Ideally speaking, scientists could do it. They, they could analyze your brains or what have you. And then, um, uh, the only value that you must invest is a utilitarian principle and the rest is only about facts, which would mean that you have the factual component in your pacifist position, that's um, the statement 100U, which would run like that. In our, in our century, well-chosen non-military alternatives are always likely to produce less harm than war. And this now sounds like a scientific statement, right, that you could test empirically. You could just go into history and you find out whether or not it's true. Let's look at the facts yesterday, somebody said, right? And, and this, I believe, is a misleading idea about it altogether. And if one starts like that, um, one makes a deep philosophical mistake. Now, correction of the mistake is, um, comes with my neo-pragmatist message and its pacifist sibling. I have here two messages, MN and <coughs> MP. The first one is um, the, the message which I call neo-pragmatism, and then I apply it on our issue, and then I want to show how it leads to pacifism. So, MN. It's philosophically naive to believe that statements such as 100, you, have an objective value-free truth value. Rather, we judge these sentences in light of our values. We call the sentences pragmatically, true or false, according to their tendency to contribute to our flourishing, harmonious, non-tragic life. Now I should say here a little, I speak here about flourishing life and harmonious life and so on, and this is a little too positive because we are dealing here with tough issues and uh, these, uh, these news which I learned 10 minutes ago is an example that it sounds a little too light-hearted to speak about harmonious well-being and flourishing life and so on, but my English was too weak to, to put it into the negative. So uh, the sentences we call true according to their tendency in helping us to avoid tragic life. 
right? So, so I can formulate this more negative if need be, but um, n nothing hinges here on the formulation. Now, um, one reason why I believe um, that this neopragmatist diagnose is true, or helpful at least, is that when I started analyzing at, at intensively as possible actual cases of war, and, tr and I tried to get uh, an objective opinion about their tendency to produce or prevent harm, I found out that no matter how much I ended, uh, entered the details, I could never objectively agree with people who were equally careful in checking the facts um, who, are, who were in favor of the war. So the, the quarrel over this uh, statement 100U, or in a specific case about the Kosovo war, for example, went on and on and on without anyone making an objective mistake. So I thought, why is it so? Why can't we come to a consensus about such issues? And m then it came for me like a revelation to learn about this meta-ethical um, sophistication from people such as Putnam, Bernard Williams, and uh, others, um, that it's naive to believe that this is about facts, and rather um, it is um, that we look on history, we look at facts, like several murders happening and so on and so on, but um, the more facts we gather, the more we get lost in them, and we cannot get a grip on them anymore, so we need simplifications. And the simplifications we do by way of projecting our values into the thing. And the question is, of course, which values should we project into it? And then I would say um, the pacifist worldview can be um, described as um, a specific way of looking into the facts. Um, you spoke yesterday, I, be I believe, about reading strategies and um, applied it to the Bible, I understood it. But of course, what I mean now is reading strategies and newspaper articles and reports from the humanitarian organizations, reading strategies with respect to all the facts that are presented on us and which are really facts, like a hundred people were killed there and these people were fighting with such and such weapons. These are objective facts, right? But if you know all the facts about a given conflict, all these tiny micro facts, you still do not know um, what you need to know in order to apply any sensible moral theory on it. So you must sort of simplify and must describe it uh, with values. Now my claim is that if you do this, that's MP on the handout, if you do this, then a sentence such as 100U is pragmatically true as it reflects values which improve our political, social, and personal lives. Or, to say again negatively, which make them less tragic, right? So, um, what I want to claim is that um, the issue is not which moral theory you subscribe to, but rather it's about a way of life, about a, about a way of looking at facts. And you can do it with pacifist um, values, but you have an on first sight, an equally respectable possibility to look at the facts with other values than the pacifist ones. And what I claim is, if you just try it once with the pacifist values, implement it into your intellectual life and into your everyday life, the more you do it, the more you will learn that it does you good. Does your relationships to other people good? Does you good in understanding politics? Or, to say it again um, in this negative um, language, um, it helps you from failing in your life, prevents you from failing. That's the message. Now, um, let, me, let me do it with a, um, with a kind of case study now. Uh, I said at the, at the outstart that it doesn't matter whether you are utilitarian or you believe in um, bellum justum theory. Now what I want to do is in section three and four and five, I want to apply this to the bellum justum tradition. Um, so what I claim is you can be pacifist within the just war tradition. It's not an oxymoron. And um, so it's, it's all independent of utilitarianism. You can, you can do, this in, ex do this exercise in each of these um, um, theories about war. And um, I concentrate now for brevity on the use in bello uh, rules, um, not the use at bellum. Um, and let's start out with the discrimination restraint, which was often um, uh, argued in favor of. Um, 
So that's the statement D on the handout. Military actions morally wrong if its attacks do not sufficiently differentiate between combatants and non-combatants. Let me make a, a tiny pacifist um, uh, remark here. I find the distinction between combatants and non-combatants morally quite dubious. So the soldiers which typically fight don't do it on their own decision but are forced into the army and suddenly only because somebody forces a uniform on them uh, there's an entitlement to erase them. I find it quite a dubious idea but let's put it aside for the moment this was um, only a polemical um, remark <coughs> from my side. Now you could say um, that pacifism of the century um, might be grounded now in the following claim, that is 100D. No military action of our times has reached its goal without producing an unacceptable amount of civilian casualties. So this is um, a statement which I am prepared to defend. And of course the question is here now, what do you do with the notion of unacceptable amount of civilian casualties? And here's a quotation um, from the debate about that. It may be, says Longley, justified to shell or bomb enemy position even though there may be civilian casualties as a result, but shooting off rounds of ammunition that unintentionally kill civilians would not be justified simply to demonstrate that the gunners are keen and up to scratch. So um, what you see here is that, that you must look in the small print of um, what it means that um, civilian casualties are unacceptable. And I believe um, what you need here is you must invoke the other prominent principle from use in Bellow tradition, which is called proportionality, and runs such, an individual war is morally wrong if its means are not commensurate with the dimension of the aggression to be stopped or prevented. So I believe these two criteria inform one another, D and P, and they only uh, make sense if you join them. Now the question is, what does proportionality mean? That's my next section. And let me give you a fact from Afghanistan. I googled it lately, um, what the latest numbers are, and of course uh, there's always interpretation about them. Uh, I have a conservative figure here, but it seems that from October 7, 2001 to December 31st, 2011, at least 14,000 Afghan civilians were killed in the course of the war against terrorism. Probably there were more, but it was at least 14,000. I believe that's a pretty, pretty objective fact, okay? Now says Michael Walzer, a few left academics have tried to figure out how many civilians actually died in Afghanistan, aiming at as high a figure as possible. I didn't do that, right? I didn't aim at as high a figure as possible. On the assumption, apparently, that if the number is greater than the number of people killed in the attacks on the Twin Towers, the war is unjust. But the claim that the numbers matter in just this way um, is wrong. It denies one of the most basic and best understood moral distinctions between premediated murder and unintended killing. So far, Walzer. Now, what I was wondering when I read that um, was, um, okay, the, metas, the numbers don't matter that way. <coughs> but how do the numbers matter then? And of course, it's a bit, um, it's a bit cruel to only speak about uh, numbers of killed people. But this is an important aspect, human life is, um, I, in this circle I might say, is a holy thing, and um, thus the numbers do matter. It's not uh, unimportant how many people get killed um, in some war. And here I have a proposal how, um, within just war theory, you should count the numbers and compare them. So on the one hand you have the number U, down on the hand handout, <coughs> the number of civilians killed by our soldiers unintentionally. This is one number. Then you have the number I with index B, the number of civilians who were murdered intentionally by Y's forces, the ones whom we are going to attack, before we went to war against Y. So Y is the bad one, right? Why, but why are, the, uh, are the evil um, human right uh, people uh, um, not respecting human rights? Now this is, this is one number, and then there's a number I C, the number of civilians who were murdered intentionally by Y's forces as a consequence of our war against Y. So if we enter the game, of course we change the course of history, and as we do change the course of history, some people are going to die, 
and not because they are killed by us, but because they are murdered by the bad ones. That is a thing that uh, can happen, and we must compare these numbers. So how do the numbers matter? Please turn the page now. I think our planned war is morally wrong, according to the criteria of discrimination and proportionality, if the second of these numbers is likely to be much greater than the first one. So if there's more people dying, being killed by the bad ones as a consequence of our intervening than the ones which had been killed anyway without our entering there. So that is, I believe, this, is, this I can extract from just war theory. And when you look at the last cases, I believe that these numbers are pretty much um, in disfavor of all those wars. And that's an empirical claim on first sight, but um, what I do now is I want to show you that it's not that easy. You still must look with the help of values into these in order to come to a clear um, point here. So next section, a closer look. First, to prevent misunderstandings. A, I do not care whether uh, what I came up with now is called proportionality and is somewhere in the tra tradition. I, I don't give a damn. I, I only say it's a reasonable constraint and it is, I believe, um, quite in coherence with just war thinking, uh, with this tradition. B, I do not claim, of course, that any of the civilians who were murdered intentionally by the evil forces as a consequence of our war against the evil ones, I do not claim that these were killed by our forces. Of course not. The others killed them, right? It's not us who did that. But see, I do claim that according to just war theory, we ought to be held responsible for the civilians who were murdered intentionally by Y's forces as a consequence of our war against Y. So I think um, that if we enter the game, then it's too easy to say, well, uh, all these murders were done by the others because we interfered we felt responsible to defend those victims of the bad ones. We felt responsible for those who were already killed and we didn't do enough yet. And we intervened. And if we do that, then of course we get responsible for what uh, came as a consequence of that. Um, that's my reason for claim C. And um, that's why I also think that in just war theory, which is so proud about taking responsibility, uh, they must think it consequently to the end. And if they do it, they end up um, in, not too, um, in not too attractive positions. So let me now rehearse uh, some shocking facts from recent wars. I have two such facts now. Um, one is um, a quotation from some report. I forget now. I, I, f I don't have the footnotes here. Summary and arbitrary killing became a generalized phenomenon throughout Kosovo with the beginning of the NATO air campaign more than 10,000 Albanian civilians were murdered by Serbs during NATO's war. Um, compare this with the numbers before. Um, it's, of course, a little disputed, but before we intervened there, um, in the year before, maybe 200, maybe 500 um, Kosovo people were murdered, um, and maybe 10 to 80 Serbian people were murdered at that time. And at the moment, uh, just before we, we entered, Milosevic did say that this is, if the NATO starts bombing, this is going to be trouble for the civilians in Kosovo. He threatened us, right? And we ignored the threat, and uh, we were not willing to send ground troops to try prevent that, but we tried to, um, to have no casualties on our soldiers' sides, and thus bombed from the air, while at the ground the massacres started, and in a dimension that had been not there before. Now, that is, a Afghanistan, that is a Kosovo story. Now let's uh, have a look at Iraq. Um, uh, according to PLOS and um, what they count excess deaths, between March 2003 and January 2011, approximately 450,000 Iraqis were killed um, in this war against terrorism. Now you may say, what does this prove? We must know not how many civilians have been killed before our intervening and afterwards, but we must know how many civilians would have been murdered if the Western states had decided against war. That's a relevant figure. But this is not a question concerning hard facts. Counterfactual, it's a counterfactual question, and counterfactuals are soft. This is one of the main lessons that I learned from Putnam, 
that counterfactual reasoning, maybe not with a few exceptions in the sciences, in the hard sciences there's may, maybe a few exceptions, but most counterfactuals you cannot judge objectively, scientifically with, an, uh, with a value-free truth value. But the only way to come to a judgment about these sentences is that you project your values into it and there we have a choice now, right? So, uh, statement six, uh, section six, judging counterfactuals in the light of pacifist values. Um, let me say I will now concentrate on the Kosovo war for the sake of brevity, but also because I think that was the best case for the adherence of humanitarian interventions. It turned the tables in Germany. Afterwards, we were again willing to send soldiers abroad while before we weren't. And many people still believe that the Kosovo war was a success. And uh, therefore, I concentrate on that. It would be easier to reason against the Afghanistan intervention or against the one in Iraq. So le let's do the Kosovo thing. It's more difficult for me. We must now try to decide about a counterfa counterfactual such as the following one. It's on the handout. If the Western countries had not bombed targets in Serbia and Kosovo, less Albanians would have been murdered, injured, or would have lost their homes than in actual history. That's, this, that's the issue we must uh, clarify now when we want to apply just war theory on the Kosovo war. Now, according to the pacifists' worldview, more counterfactual causes of history are relevant than according to proponents of war. The proponents of war, they say, well, this sentence is very easy to verify. We just assume that uh, not bombing means doing nothing and then the bad Serbians would have killed in the long course of events, would have killed all those, these uh, Kosovo people. Having here already quite a negative picture of the Serbian nature, that they are racist or full of hatred or whatever, certain values you project in here, and you do not stop thinking much about alternative causes of action which do not amount to bombing. And now let me say, I was yesterday once more quite angry, and I don't like that, that I'm getting angry at it, at this Michael Walzer quotation that you brought, it's just one more phone call. Sorry, that's rubbish. It's not about making phone calls. It's, um, we have much, much more to do and to say when it comes to um, doing something else, doing something else actively, than bombing. And let me say what it would have been in the Kosovo case. We had uh, in the Kosovo the so-called Kosovo verification mission which had observed um, on many, many spots in, the, in that region, region what was going on. They wrote reports again and again and published them and so forth. Now, one of the, the ideas that um, the pacifists would have proposed is making this Kosovo verification mission stronger, sending still more people in observing, still more people in reporting, reporting in Serbian language into the um, Serbian um, internet and what have you, so to, um, to give a clearer picture of what's going on on the ground there, and the main reason why we stopped it was the so-called massacre at Ratchak, which still is not investigated uh, to the end. So there's a report of the European Union about that by uh, independent physicians, and uh, strange enough, this, this thousands of pages containing report is secret, top secret, I wonder why. The Finnish uh, doctors who had been there on the spot before published a short paper, and that's absolutely unclear if it was a massacre on civilians or not. You do not know. But the, this massacre, where 40 people or 50 people have been shown dead, um, let's say the 50 corpses there, um, made us believe that uh, there's no alternative than bombing. <coughs> but that, that's rubbish, I'm sorry to say. This, this saying there's no alternative is not an objective, value-free statement, but this is an expression of some other values, namely the values um, which amount to pessimism about human nature, which is if you see these evil people, the evil Serbians, first value here, right? The evil Serbians, the only way to stop them from doing the worst is coming with guns and bombs. But that is, that is a certain picture of what humans are. In German we call it Menschenbild, right? Certain picture here. And this picture transports pessimist values about human nature. And this is not the only values which we could invest here. I would say what we could do, we could invest positive values, and um, that amounts to um, the pacifist um, advice, how to look at reality in such cases. That's IP on the handout down there on page three. Um, you have an epistemic imperative here concerning nonviolent alternatives. Always search for attractive nonviolent alternatives to projected military action. And this amounts to 
uh, many skills that you must invest here. On one hand, you must look very carefully at the facts, which are really there and which are ugly, and you don't want to look at them, uh, you, you shrink back from them, but you must do it. And you must be able to stand that, and this um, demands your endurance. But on the other hand, what you need is fantasy. You must exercise what could be called your sense for possibilities. You must study um, human psychology. You must uh, learn about history. So uh, many, many things you must invest here in order to propose again and again new types of action. And making just another phone call is a ridiculous diminu diminution and caricature of what we pacifists propose here. Now, um, the epistemic imperative in favor of which I'm speaking here um, reflects certain values. And um, it is not that hard facts tell you when it starts getting crazy to continue with that search. It's a decision when you stop with it. And I describe pacifists as people who um, follow this line longer with more endurance than others. The, the other people, of course, also try for a while to, make, to search still for alternatives, some diplomatic means and what have you. But the pacifists do this longer and with more endurance, with more energy, with more power of imagination and fantasy and possibility, and first of all, with more optimism. It's very important here that they are optimistic here. And at the same time, by the way, they are pessimistic in thinking that you can control the bad ones um, technically with good weapons. Right? There's, there, there's a mixture of pessimism and optimism in their worldview. Now, this, as I say, it's a, uh, on the top of page four of the handout now, as I say, the so-called hard facts do not tell us at which moment the pacifist's, pacifist search crosses the border of irrationality. They do not decide about claims such as minus P. Everything has been tried. There is no alternative, Tina, yes? Um, now, I am prepared to say that when I um, use this pacifist attitude in looking at um, our world, I am indeed always prepared for the possibility that I fail with that. So I don't have a built-in guarantee that it will work. I do not know what I would have said in the case um, of um, Germany's attack on Poland. My, my wife is Polish and her grandfather was fighting on a horse against uh, the German tanks. And I do not know um, if this advice to try other things still is always um, able to help me to remain with a clean moral conscience. Not at all. It can be that I get guilty here. And it's not easy to face that. It's also not easy to, for example, speak to people from Kosovo and say that I would have advised against that war. But in brackets, I must add, I'm a bit surprised the Kosovo, Kos Kosovo Albanians are grateful to us, although we didn't risk the lives of our soldiers, and although in the course of events 10,000 people were massacred. And it's not only the dead people, of course, uh, had to suffer a lot in that. So I'm surprised why they are grateful to us. I find it's, it's strange to understand that. And still, the more you get in contact with the people, the more you see that it is quite um, a possibility that you end up guilty with this kind of pacifism. But I believe there's no other way. There's no clean way out of such um, tra tragic situations. Now, um, let, me, um, let me once more illustrate that this everything has been tried, that uh, this word everything here, this is not a factual thing, but it, it is a matter of decision and of our values. Values. I have a quotation from um, Elstein, who famously is in favor of uh, this war against terrorism in the tradition of um, bellum Justum theory. She says, during the Kosovo War, we aim to sacrifice Serbian civilians rather than risk the life of a single American soldier. And this was true about the Germans as well. Such a policy is not acceptable on just war grounds. That commitment must always be carried through on the battlefield in order to protect protect civilians as thorough as possible in a theater of modern war. The United States must do everything it can to minimize civilian deaths, and it is doing so. And this last sentence, and it is doing so, um, this is, um, you, you cannot get uh, straight about it objectively, but I would say there's a very tough um, value system in her background here, which makes her think it is so, 
Well, in fact, the, the, the more attractive values looking at this uh, claim, it is um, rather um, pragmatically wrong to say that, I, I think. Now, let me finish in my next section, last section. Um, I want to draw a very quick parallel from Kant's philosophy of science here. Um, and I try to, it's like this, when I look at reality with such epistemic imperatives, and I brought you only one in my writings about pacifism, I have a few more of that, but I brought you this IP as one um, example here. Um, I was wondering, is there a parallel in the natural sciences um, to this kind of procedure? Because the natural sciences are, are said to be so very objective, right? And on the other hand, we learned from, learned from the pragmatists that even in the <coughs> natural sciences, we cannot do without epistemic virtues. And uh, what I want to show you now is that indeed, e even from Kant's philosophy of science, we can extract something which is comparable in structure to, um, to my um, way of dealing uh, with uh, war situations. So here's a principle from Kant. It's the principle of homogeneity. It's one of his regulative ideas, which are in some sense um, a priori in Kant. And he advises us to do the following. That is an imperative K. IK, IK. Do not rest satisfied with an excessive number of different original genera. Always try to give an explanation of the manifold by detecting common deep structure. This is what physicists do, right? They, for example, they see all the chaos here and then they say, okay, this is cons all the stuff here is consisting of atoms. And in the beginning they thought it's four different elements, right? And then it got more and more and then it was 120 atoms. And um, then they said, okay, this is too much. We are not satisfied with that. We believe that the deep structure consists of a smaller number of things. Then they uh, came up with the elementary particles, in the beginning three of them. Now there were hundreds again, and then they came up with quarks, and so forth and so forth. So what I want to say is there's never a point when the natural scientists, the physicists, are um, forced by reality to stop believing in a simple underlying structure, structure of the universe, whenever there's experiments which, which um, stop you from that, it means to them, let's search further, let's attempt further to minimize the number of elementary particles. And this is something which you cannot get objectively verified, but that's something which you invest from the start. We expect and want nature to be such that we can describe her in this way. And um, then I would say, if that's um, a respectable way in the sciences, it's good to reflect about it and to make it, um, to make it explicit. If we make it explicit, the values which we want to invest into our sciences, and the very same thing we can do when we discuss pacifism in history, we, um, rather than saying this is a matter of hard facts, now let's do the facts, we ought to make explicit when we smuggle in values um, without noticing it, and as soon as we put the values on the table, we can see that my values are distinguished from yours, and we can compare them, and we can ask which values, with which values do we want to look at the world. Wittgenstein says somewhere, um, the world of the optimist is another world than the one of the pessimist, and I believe um, that is very much true if you are a pacifist and invest your love for human nature, your optimism for humans, and also your optimism in general on the one hand, but also your pessimism um, with respect to the um, power of violence to solve problems. This is a, here's a pessimist element, right? If you are humble and, um, and prevent the, the hubris of thinking that you can predict how you bump around and solve problems, um, if you put all these values together and apply them also in everyday life um, when it comes to misunderstandings between people and conflicts in everyday life and so forth, um, if you try to put all this into your system of beliefs, um, integrated as it were, the pragmatist always had a holistic picture that you must test your opinions, separate opinions in the whole framework in which you are moving and must see if they help you in leading a better life, or let me say a less tragic life, um, then if you try it, you will see, this is my invitation to you, you will see that um, you go well along with this pacifist world view. And, um, and so the question is, do we want to be optimistic about the chances of peace and pessimistic about the dangers of war? 
or do we want to be the other way around? And you get what you invest here. You get it back somehow. And that's why you called it self-fulfilling uh, pacifism. This is, of course, somewhat, um, it, it's dangerous to describe it like that, because uh, I do not deny that there's an independent world out there, right? But a lot depends on how we look at it, and uh, thus I propose um, to stop um, making the mistake of believing that there is objective reality which stops us from being pacifist, because realism prevents us here, but rather be more honest with ourselves and respect the values that we have to invest here, and then choose the pacifist ones. Thanks.